The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. and welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Marsha Alvar. My guest today is writer and humorist Roy Blunt. He's the author of 10 books, including a novel called First Hubby. If you haven't run across those, perhaps you've seen one of the dozens of articles he's written for dozens of publications. Not those? Well, maybe if you're a public radio listener, you've heard him performing with Garrison Keillor. If none of those apply, this is your chance, because meet Roy Blunt. You, Your new book is called uh, Where Were We? Now Where Were Now We? Where were, well, now, so where, now, were we? where Were now, We? Where Were We? Yeah. We were in the 80s, a decade you didn't like very much. I didn't like the 80s. No, they, uh, everybody thought about money all the time in the 80s. You know, it, it, it's, it was a strange period because everybody talked about the bottom line all the time as if this was some kind of uh, uh, standard, and yet everybody completely ignored the bottom line. Everybody was always making up all this artificial money and just borrowing money. And one thing that it just occurred to me the other day, one of the things wrong with the 80s was that bankers started jogging and you couldn't tell them from anybody else. Bankers ought to be fat. You know, they ought to be big people with uh, vests and watch fobs and they should be slightly dyspeptic so they wouldn't just <laughs> throw money around, you know, and, and they'd be satisfied with the meal they had so that they wouldn't be so greedy for money. And, and you could recognize a banker and you would know how to talk to him. The bankers just got to be, uh, got, you know, the Republicans, I mean, the Republicans were supposed, the, the sole virtue of Republicans used to be that they uh, were careful with money, you know. At least they wouldn't, you wouldn't have much fun with them, but they wouldn't run you into debt. Uh, they lost that virtue, and yet somehow they took over the country. I, I can't understand that at all. Well, you said that everybody talked about the bottom line, but they didn't really pay any attention to it. What is the bottom line? What well, was the bottom line in the 80s? Well, it's supposed to, well, the bottom, they, it just, the bottom line got left way up here, so we stayed below the bottom line. <laughs> and, and it was like, you know, you know, it's like if you uh, stop study, if you go to college and you, or, or it was like drugs. It was, I think that uh, that the Re Ronald Reagan was a kind of drug. Uh, you know, if you start, you know, everybody tells you now you better not do do those drugs because you'll get in tr get in trouble. There are certain you know it's just going to come back to catch you. But you start doing drugs and you think, hey, this is this is fun. I can do this, you know, and you do it for ten years and then suddenly it it catches up with you. You know, everybody looked at Ronald Reagan and he was just perfectly happy and serene and people thought, well. We can't be in any trouble because look how happy the president is. And uh, it was like everybody was stoned on Ronald Reagan. Why did he have that power? Why are the 80s going to be identified so completely with this one person? He was an actor, and, uh, an actor who found his role. Uh, you know, Spencer Tracy might have been good in the role earlier, but he uh, made would a have wonderful been president. I, I would have rather had Spencer Tracy. But, uh, but Reagan fit the role and people were, were uh, worried and wanted to see some serenity projected and also Reagan figured out what other presidents had not which is that you shouldn't let things get under your skin. I mean Nixon would get, uh, Nixon would sweat and Jimmy Carter would get tense you know and stiff and uh, people would say oh you know and but Reagan you couldn't get his goat. He was just this sort of uh, uh, blissful figure. He was like one of these guru figures. Uh, I know a guy who's brother believes that a certain 13-year-old Indian youth is God. You know, he belongs to a cult which believes in this guru. And this guru, since he is God, can speak any language in the world, of course, but he chooses to speak broken English. You know, and uh, they, and this guy, they believe in this guy as God. And the sillier this it's guy gets, the more they believe in him. And I think that's what Reagan was like, is that people just bought his act, and the sillier he got, the more uh, people just thought, well, life's not so hard, you know, we, we're, we're number one, and uh, let's go for it. Let's don't think about the difficulties of life or, or whether we have to run up a debt, you know, whether debt's a problem. Now, suddenly Reagan's gone, and everybody's saying, oh, we got this huge deficit. Right, I was going to say, we've snapped out of the I 80s. Where has that left us? Left now that left we're in the, in the 90s. 90s. Left us with George Bush, who, uh, whose wife writes books with dogs. Uh, you know, the, the, I, don't, I'm referring, I haven't read Millie's book yet, Millie's I have book, to admit. Which, uh, you know, uh, Mrs. Dukakis, people 
go around saying it's a good thing the caucuses didn't get elected because Mrs. Dukakis was drinking cleaning fluid and stuff, and that it would have been embarrassing, but at least Mrs. Dukakis would not have written a book with her dog, I don't think. Uh, the Bushes not only write books with dogs, but they sleep <laughs> with their dog. their dog. According to this book, which I read, as a matter of fact, with mounting uh, fascination, uh, this dog, by, I don't mean that as an endorsement, <laughs> but, but this dog wakes them up every morning in the dog's words, according to this book, by shaking my ears pretty hard in their faces. So that's how the leader of the... I don't think... You know, the whole thing is sort of, it seems to me, an effort to establish how down-to-earth the bushes are. But to me, people who are really down-to-earth don't sleep with their dogs. Well, can you see where we're heading in the 90s, if the 80s were this sort of narcotic dream of everything is swell? Where, where are we going to end up in 1999? Well, that's what everybody wonders, isn't it? Uh, there are all sorts of awfully ominous things looming. I mean, as we all know, there's a possibility of, of war, maybe of holy war. I just can't think of anything worse. And, uh, and there's a possibility of uh, economic uh, collapse, or, or at least, you know, I mean, it's hard. And uh, but you know, it's just going. At least that's at least we're acknowledging that uh, that awful things exist. And uh, and it seems to me it'll be a more serious de decade. It may may not be as uh, it won't be as blithe, but at least it will seem more like real life. You're so interested in politics. Why didn't you take up politics as a career instead of uh, <laughs> being a humorist? Because uh, I don't know how to run anything. I couldn't. Uh, uh, well, there are a lot of people say, "Who does?" Right. That's right. But uh, at least, uh, but I know I don't know how to run anything, and I have a tendency to tell people I don't know how to run things. And uh, also, you know, also once you become a politician, you have to start saying figuring out what people want you to say and, and saying that, which uh, I wouldn't like at all. How does somebody become a humorist? I mean, there's not a humorist academy and there's no degree in humor. Well, I don't know. It's, there's probably some kind of shameful psychological uh, reason. But, and I uh, want you to tell me right now. Uh, yeah, I, w I, w I would, but it's uh, uh, maybe a little later. Now, I, I don't know. I, you know, who knows? But pe there's, uh, all, all I know is that my English teacher in 10th grade gave me S.J. Perlman and uh, E.B. White and uh, James Thurber and Robert Benchley and A.J. Liebling to read, and I thought, I, I like these guys, and it looks like I won't be a baseball immortal after all, so I'll try to be a, a humorist. And I grew up lead, reading uh, uh, Mark Twain and, and uh, Pogo. Walt Kelly was a big influence on me, and uh, uh, I don't know, so I, and my family kidded around a lot. I tell you what, I'll tell you the truth, uh, that my mother had a really hard childhood. And she, I, mean, I remember uh, kids would come over to my house and my mother, for lunch, and my mother would say, well, okay, now the adults will eat kitchen indoors and all you children have to go sit out in the yard and eat because we don't eat with children. And my friends would be, you know, wouldn't know how to take it. And then my mother would laugh and say, oh, we, you probably don't joke at your house as much as we do. But, you know, I think that probably came from the fact that, I mean, there was a kind of, I bet, you know, people made my mother sit out. And according to my mother's account of her childhood, she really felt left out. And, uh, and she was orphaned and mistreated and everything. So I, I, I really have a feeling that my mother's sense of humor grew out a kind of desperate uh, way to, uh, to deal with her childhood. And I think I inherited that. I think that the only kind of sense of humor that will... Uh, that will make you a professional is a really desperate, or at least make you any good, is a, a kind of desperate sense of humor. You have to need to, it's the only way you know how to make sense out of things. And uh, so, I mean, people ask me how to be funny and stuff, and to me, it's just the only way I know how to make sense out of things. Which is just who you are. Well, I guess so. I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, I, well, you know, I mean, I, 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 it's really hard to talk about humor, I think. Uh, or maybe it wouldn't be hard. I mean, it's hard to be funny about humor. Uh, but, uh, you know, people ask me, do you feel obliged to be funny all the time? Do people, and I just say no, which is not a very funny answer. But it's but in different ways. Do people expect you to be funny all the time? Well, they don't for very long. I mean, because uh, <laughs> it doesn't... Uh, I mean, I, and, and it's much easier. To, I can. It's easier for me to think of something funny to say about feet or pumpkins or uh, or uh, alligators than for somebody to say 
did something funny happen to you this morning? And I can't think of anything funny at all. You know, I just don't have things filed away under funny. In addition to the wonderful models uh, of, of humor that the teacher uh, gave to you to read, some of the greatest humorists in the country's history and your, your mother and, and her history, where you grew up is really integral uh, to your sense of humor, the fact that you grew up in Georgia. Why, even though you haven't lived there for a long time, is that still so much of who you are? That's where I learned to talk and learned to use language. And it seems to me that Southerners have a distinctive sense of how funny American English is. There's something really incongruous. I mean, there's so many different, everything from Yiddish to Ojibwe or something is all mixed into American English. And uh, in fact, uh, Ernest Hemingway said that American literature begins with Mark, a book by Mark Twain called Huckleberry Finn. And the great achievement of Huckleberry Finn was to take uh, dialect and mix it in with vigorous formal English and, and cre they created a, a whole new mode of, of writing. Um, so, and I've always been fascinated by trying to make things sound like something on the page, you know, being able to capture the sound of, of words on the page, or just noises on the page. Um, and so, and I think that's kind of, Southerners are more oral, or, you know, they're, they're, they tend to write in a more oral and oral, right for the ear and the mouth more than the, than the eye. And, I, and I, so that's, you know, that's just the way I grew up. Also, there's a, also, Southerners like to play around with language in ways that uh, you, you see in country music a lot, and uh, but uh, there's a, you know, uh, for instance, there's a, it seems to me a particular Southern uh, story about a guy who was asked if he believed in infant baptism, you know, and he said, believe in it, hell, I've seen it done. You know, it seems something distinctively Southern about that, but, uh, you know, and there's a, there's a certain kind of, you know, fooling around with language like that. In, in not in a kind of highly refined literary way, but in a in a way I don't know how to uh, what term to give it, but it's, it's southern. I was thinking of it. I don't know if it was uh, Henny Youngman or Georgie Jessel, somebody who would who would say what things were funny and which weren't. Like banana is funny, but right. apple isn't funny. Pickle is funny, but carrot isn't right. funny. And it wondered if some re energy. if some regions of the country are just inherently funnier than other ones. Well, the Irish are funny, and the Irish are also really sad, and have hor do horrible. The Irish uh, horrible things happen in Ireland. I think that's. Uh, I've always thought that the South was a lot like Ireland. There's a kind of lyricism and also a kind of uh, a combination of repression and sensuality, sensuousness, uh, and also lots of violence. I think that probably a sense of humor requires uh, rechanneled violence. So really, you know, uh, you can have a sort of mild sense of humor to and not be and not have a feeling for violence but uh, uh, funny writing and funny talking tends to do a kind of violence to the language they have a sense of uh, wildness you know the South always had a sense of wildness which in many ways has served it badly but uh, for instance it's Pickett's charge everybody just went ah you know and <laughs> and got mowed down that was a typical southern charge and but if that had been a uh, somebody talking it might have worked out well mm. if there hadn't been any guns involved but obviously the South has, has had terrible things in its history, and uh, it's had to be funny to uh, redeem those things. Do you think uh, comedy itself is getting funnier or, or less funny? I mean, there's so much controversy about various comedians now who, who some people say go over a line when I mean, they're raunchy or they're crude or whatever, and just sort of what the state of comedy is, the state of humor. Well, as far as stand up speaking comedy the problem with is that one problem is that raunch has been run into the ground I, I think the greatest comedian greatest comic uh, person of, of my lifetime has been Richard Pryor who uh, in his prime was had this great sort of liberating way of dealing with matters of race and raunch that uh, uh, was just wonderful and uh, and then, but once you and once you get that kind of language into comedy, uh, I mean, I felt like once Richard Pryor opened up all that stuff using all those words, I couldn't really write like uh, E.B. White anymore, which is fine with me. I was I'd much rather uh, 
you know, be as uh, have as much, you know, be as wild as Richard Pryor. Well, than is it just because it looked like he was anyway. having more fun well, than you were? just opened things up. Well, he's had more fun. Yeah, he just <laughs> opened things up. You can't go back to, I mean, that's the thing about Andy Rooney. If you've ever seen uh, Andy Rooney talking about check stubs or something, and meanwhile Richard Pryor <laughs> talking about uh, uh, things Richard Pryor talked about. But then once something that happens, then you're left with all this territory that's been opened up, and and other people come in, and just like anything else, they run it into the ground. They don't run the territory in the ground. They run the run raunch into the ground. Andrew Dice Clay, to me, uh, I hate to use the word obscene because it's become a legal term. But if it weren't a legal term, I don't think the courts can deal with obscenity, and it shouldn't be in the courts. But it shouldn't be a, shouldn't be arrested for what you say in a nightclub. But I've listened to tapes of Andrew Dice Clay's performances, and I, uh, legality aside, I would say they're obscene because. He's, uh, he's talking to people in the front row. I've listened to the tape when he, he's talking to a family in the front row. There's a daughter and a father, and he just starts telling them about how, what they want to do to each other, you know what I mean? And it, it's really vile. It's just vile. He, it's and it's mean not funny. Spirited. It's mean, and it's, ag it's bullying and aggressive, and it's all about forcing. That's the thing about two live crew. There's great rap music, but two live crews. Uh, nasty as you want to be is just all about forcing people to do things, and see, that's not funny. Where do you draw the line? I mean, Don Rickles would do that too. Don Rickles was, was seen by a lot of people when he first started, a very mean-spirited kind yeah, of cruel insult person. Comedian. Yeah, but I mean, well, I, he's not my favorite comedian actually, but he was. I mean, it was it was. What, what's the word? In fun. I mean, there's uh, you know the whole. Uh, challenge of humor is to go as far as you can in fun. You know, be as serious as you can and as brazen and as brave and as uh, crazy as you can in fun. But it's always, there's always got to be, it's hard to talk about what's necessary, but there's got to be a joke in there. It's got to be, uh, uh, it's got to be not, it's, it shouldn't be oppressive. It's got to be liberating. And, and insults can be liberating if, if they're, you know, I mean, if comic insults can be liberating, can, can give people a sense of, uh, of, uh, Letting in fresh air, but they can also make you feel sick. And I think Andrew Dice Clay makes, I mean, I know he makes me feel sick. You know, the humor is, it's hard to talk about because it's like art, I guess. You know, I mean, people won't say, gee, I like this. They'll say, well, I don't know what I like, but when I see it, you know, I, I know what it is. And one person's humor is just not another person's humor. And I, I was struck by a review I read of your, of your novel, First Hubby. I mean, there were some very nice reviews of that book. Really, you know, loved the book. Then there was this one that was in, I think, the New York Daily News. It said, reading First Hubby is maybe not always the most rewarding reading you could do, but it is not a totally unpleasant experience. <laughs> that's one of those things. That, one of those reviews, I don't remember that review, but it it, uh, that's the kind of thing. Somebody that who makes just feel doesn't, good about they don't work. get you. Oh, they I just in, don't get you. I shouldn't do this, but I was in the, I read the most appalling thing about my work that in the, the Eastern Washington you Library. You keep a little book of yeah, these things. Of, of bad things. Whenever I feel uh, too good about myself, I'm going to bring this out and read it. It says, uh, oh, um, well, I should, he says, <laughs> blunt self indulgence. Self-indulgence is freely tapped as a source for cynical insight. How do you like that? Oof. You know, it was one of these little analytical little reviews in Publishers Weekly written by somebody who gets 40 cents a book or something. But, uh, you know, there are way. I mean, you can write about anything in reductive ways. But, but I mean, everybody, no, people are really often really offended by, by saying something. By something. You should, I, I'd feel like I weren't any good if, somebody wasn't put off, but there's a difference between offended and uh, disgusted. And that, that's, well, that's part, of, that's part of the life you've chosen, too, that if you're going to be out there like that, n no one is, I mean, no one's going to please everybody all the time. Yeah, hey, it's not all that bad. I mean, uh, I, w I once, I was down at, a, I was writing a story about coon hunting, the hunting of raccoons down in, in, for Sports Illustrated, and I was down in Spanish Fort, Texas. And somebody came up to me and said, well, you got the most wonderful job in the world uh, covering sports. And I said, well, yeah, but I have to pay, take all these planes and, uh, uh, and uh, I'll carry them out and travel around all the time. And he said, well, I bet it r beats running a tree saw eight hours a day. <laughs> and, uh, I agree. Another guy, I th also talked to a guy. Is that sort of like, gee, it's better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. Yeah, that's what he did was run a tree saw eight hours a day. And, uh, he worked in the lumber mill or something, and I so I haven't complained about my job since.
Well, I wanted to, uh, we've gone from somebody who didn't get it, I guess we'll go to, some, to somebody who did get it, which was me reading the, uh, the piece that you wrote about the spa, about going to the spa. This is another very 80s thing in this book of, of 80s essays. And, and I mean, the line, I, I, this is the kind of line where you're sitting in a bus and you're reading and you go, ha, 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 and everyone stares at it like, like you're odd. Bless. You had your, your body fat percentage tested, which sounds frightening to me. But you say the results, let's say I had enough fat on me to manufacture an entire, if shapeless, 10-year-old child and a box of candles. Tell me about going to the, why did you go to the spa? I mean, you say you deeply distrust anyone who's fit and thin. Well. Fact, you say something rather harsh about people who are like that. Did I say that? Well. You, you did. I, the story, uh, GQ magazine called me up and said, would you like to go to a spa and write something about it? And I thought, well, that'll be, I often do things that that I shouldn't do and, and, and write about them for the sake of, uh, of comedy. And uh, so I said, sure, and I went out to the spa. And as a matter of fact, I'd been feeling pretty bad. And uh, a week of exercise and eating uh, proper foods, proper is not the right word, eating uh, unfatty foods did me a world of good. And I felt like a jackrabbit. I was bouncing around. <laughs> I felt too good. But it did me. So I had to honestly. Uh, and as I say, I had this fat test, and that gave me pause. So I really, for a couple of years, was, was extremely um, good about what I ate and exercised. For a couple of years, I kept it up, and I was in great shape. Now I've gotten fat again, but I'm still in better shape than I was before I went to the spa. And, you know, I, the word spa to me is, a, is kind of an offensive term, and I felt bad. I'd be out there running around with the group. You know, they're all, it costs you $2,100 a week, probably costs more than that now. To go. I, I, did, I, went because I went for free because I was writing this story. But, you know, if you have to pay $2,100 a week to get healthy. We were out there sort of doing our exercises in our, in our blue sweatshirt, sweatsuits and things, and there would be guys out there pulling rocks up out of the ground, you know, and I would, I would sort of avert, <laughs> run past them, you know, and they'd be pulling up these rocks, and they would look at me in ways that I, I wish I could look at other people in ways that they were looking at me because they, were, they clearly had the, the high, moral high ground. I mean, they were losing weight the way you ought to is by working. But when you work at a typewriter all day, you do need exercise. And the, the key thing is that you should not, somebody told me a, the key to losing weight, being healthy and staying in shape is two things, eat less fat and walk a lot. Sounds sensible. Here you went to the spa. This is a great, this is a great, uh, paragraph about what state you were in when you were left full of bounce and lusting after carrots. As I write this, it has been five weeks since I slouched off towards Tucson, and I am still renewed in italics. Thank God Canyon Ranch isn't run by the Reverend Moon. I'd be in some airport right now asking people for money. I continue to get more and more renewed. That's right. That's, true. That's no longer true since I wrote it. I mean, I've got, I, I have backslid. <laughs> I think probably your fans find that comforting that you know you didn't well, stick with this. It would people be people don't want. To, uh, yeah, it but would I'd, alter your personality if you. Well, it could, but I'd rather be healthy. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> if, if I feel myself, I'm, I'd like to get more healthy again. I'm not going to just be fat. I think bankers should be fat, but I don't think humorists have to be fat. But That's, it is hard sitting at a typewriter. Uh, you do get fat. Yeah, I, I'll, I should sit at the typewriter. But in addition to the to the fitness craze that became such a big deal in in the '80s, um, there was an, an ominous development as far as Coca Cola goes. Which I mean, you have a long history with this drink, which probably you should just talk about. Well, I grew up in in the Atlanta area. Coca Cola is from Atlanta, and I drank a whole lot of Coca Cola when I was growing up. I don't drink it anymore, partly because of my health. You know, I either drink things that are worse for me than Coke or things that are better for me than Coke. I never like to sort of take the middle ground. But um, the uh, but I was appalled to see in the 80s that uh, Coke suddenly, I mean, one of the really uh, typical of the 80s was the trashy move of uh, changing, you know, Coke is it, and suddenly they change it. It comes new Coke or whatever they call it. And then they go back and call the old Coke classic Coke. That is, a, that's really tacky. But that's like writing a book with your dog. <laughs> but uh, Ahead of its time. Well, one appalling thing about it was that uh, Coke became more like Pepsi. I mean, I don't have anything against Pepsi, particularly. But you didn't like it very much, though, well, really. Well, I don't like it very much, no. But it, the thing is that Pepsi is a Republican drink. I mean, Pepsi, Pepsi people were big supporters of Nixon, and Nixon got Pepsi into, what, China. And, uh, and the Coke people were big supporters of... Uh, Carter and Carter got uh, Pepsi, uh, Coke into Russia or the other way around. 
And um, so I associate Pepsi as a Republican drink, and it just seemed to me another sign of the Republicanization of America for, for Coke to start wanting to taste like Pepsi, when in fact Coke seemed to me the original uh, cola, right? The Coke invented cola, and for Coke to want to taste more like Pepsi was like uh, Louis Armstrong to want to sound more like Al Hurt. The other, the other uh, description, you, a wonderful one, was if fame had begun outperforming 60 Minutes in the TV ratings, that Mike Wallace would begin breakdancing. Breakdancing, that's right, <laughs> that's right. Whatever, you know, people... Did you ever whatever. figure out why, why Coke would do that? I mean, I agree with you personally that it always did taste much better than Pepsi, and why they'd fool around with it, I could never understand. People just want to fool around with things. The only thing left is Levi's. They fool around with Levi's a little bit. I'm not doing it. I'm not endorsing Levi's, but... Uh, there are a couple other products I won't mention, but Levi's, I grew up wearing Levi's and they're still Levi's, and yet they come out with all these weird, remember designer jeans, and thank God they're gone. I guess, the, but you know, all you need is Levi. And they, they're a basic thing. They go back, not, there are too few things in this country that go back to early days, because Levi's were made out of, I don't know, tent cloth or something. They figured it out way back in the, uh, in the mining days in California. Uh, you know, things get yuppied up so bad. Now, I hear that the market in, in Seattle is in danger of getting yupped up. Uh, that would be an awful shame. It won't smell like fish anymore. Well, and nothing ever holds still. I mean, things are always changing. I was struck by uh, looking through your book, Crackers, which talked a lot about President Jimmy Carter, George Mann, who went to the White House. He's in, Now, here's somebody who left the White House in less than wonderful circumstances, and he's risen again. Yeah, uh, I think Carter was got a bad break. People uh, were too, you know, too critical of. I mean, first, I didn't, he he would not have been my first uh, choice to be president to begin with. We're from the same state, but then, but I would have picked somebody else. I think to be to lead the the Democrats. But once they chose Jimmy Carter, I was sort of proud. And uh, then they uh, suddenly everybody loved him. It was amazing. Norman Mailer wrote fulsomely about Jimmy Carter. Uh, Hunter Thompson wrote about Jimmy Carter. Uh, John Simon. I mean, all these pe all these harsh critics of Hunter all Thompson. Hunter Thompson <laughs> wrote this story about how great Jimmy Carter was. Normally, all these people who had just been attacking politicians all the time suddenly they loved Jimmy Carter. It was a strange thing, but he, once he got in office, people said, "Wow, what is this guy? Where he's from Georgia, and he's he got a bad smile. He had the same smile he always had, and in fact, his uh, he had." He, he was uh, right about a lot of things. I remember the debate in which he was uh, got in trouble for citing his Amy on nuclear proliferation. Right. I was talking to my that daughter. That was the daddy. Daddy, yeah. what about nuclear weapons? Yeah, and uh, and everybody said, "Oh God, there's Jimmy Carter, Amy." But the 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 I mean, it was obviously a lame thing to say. But the truth was that Amy had a lot more sense about nuclear proliferation than. Uh, Carter's opponent had. That, and at least uh, she hasn't gone off and written a book about her parents her, like the Reagan doll, children parents, had. Yeah. Now, you, you wrote a book about, uh, about the Carters, and it seems like Ronald Reagan and his family certainly provided enough grist for your pieces. Why not a book about the Reagans? Well, I thought about doing that, but I wrote a lot about the Reagans, uh, but I didn't want to talk to any of them. I mean, the, the Carter people fascinated me because uh, I didn't talk. I talked to Billy. I can't think. I wouldn't want to go talk to uh, Moon Reagan or whoever he is. Uh, I don't know. I just didn't like him. I don't like to write about things. <laughs> I, I like to write from a distance about things I don't like, but I don't want to just get all too deep into uh, things I don't like because I'd get. Uh, I think it would have. It would gotten awkward, and they wouldn't have let me uh, get get into them. I would think because. I, but. I wrote quite a bit about Reagan uh, during the 80s, and people, it was hard. I once wrote that Reagan knew as much about how government actually works as Betty, Carter, Betty Crocker knows about how to bake a cake. <laughs> Sounds like a good book to me. Well, I want to thank you for uh, visiting with us I on Upon Reflection. Like Roy Blunt, Jr., yeah. his newest book, Now Where Were We? It's out in paperback. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.